Welcome to Weekly News Highlights. United Nations aid agencies said Syria faces an unprecedented hunger crisis with over 9.3 million people lacking adequate food while the country's coronavirus outbreak, though apparently controlled for now, could still accelerate. Last week, the World Food Program, or the WFP, told a briefing in Geneva that the number of people short of essential food has risen by 1.4 million in the past six months. The WFP said food prices had also soared by more than 200% in less than a year due to the free fall in neighboring Lebanon's economy and the COVID-19 lockdown measures in Syria. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization representative in Syria told a separate briefing that after nine years of armed conflict, more than 90% of Syria's population lives under the $2 per day poverty line and humanitarian needs are growing. In a development described as a major breakthrough in the battle against COVID-19, tests have led researchers and scientists to an unexpected possible treatment for this disease. The results of these tests showed that the activator dexamethasone is able to save a third of those infected with the contagion, whose cases are the most serious. Isra Faleh has more. Researchers, led by a team from Oxford University, tested the drug widely available to more than 2,000 COVID-19 patients with severe symptoms. It was found that dexamethasone reduced death rates among patients who were able to breathe only through devices. For its part, the World Health Organization welcomed the preliminary results of a clinical test conducting in the UK and showed that dexamethasone may save the lives of people with the critical conditions, COVID-19. Dexamethasone is an old corticosteroid which was used since 1960 for many uh, conditions including inflammatory conditions like systemic lupus and uh, rheumatoid arthritis and, se and several GIT related uh, diseases like uh, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. A recent trial called the Recovery Trial from uh, Oxford University in the UK on around 2,000 patients, uh, they showed that uh, 6 mg uh, dexamethasone taken either orally or IV for 10 days reduced uh, mortality in severely ill patients uh, who required ventilations uh, in around 30% of patients, and it also reduced mortality by 20% in patients who require only oxygen therapy. Uh, on the other hand, uh, dexamethasone was, uh, did not show any benefit in patients with mild, uh, mild cases of COVID-19 infection. Uh, it seems that uh, dexamethasone uh, may control what we call a cytokine storm, where the immune system overreacts when it is unable uh, to, uh, to handle the virus. And this might lead to a secretion of several cytokines, leading to organ failure and multi-organ damage, including uh, severe respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, it should be noted that this uh, study is uh, still not published. It is now under, under peer review, and I think they uh, expect that it should be published by the end of this month. The intensive care unit ICU in the Ministry of Health approved dexamethasone as a treatment protocol for COVID-19 patients after issuance of recommendations from the World Health Organization in this regard. COVID-19 infections are reportedly seeing a drop in Europe. However, globally, the number of infections is expected to reach 10 million by next week, with the number of deaths expected to reach half a million. The head of the World Health Organization, Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, stated that more than 10.8 million COVID-19 cases had been reported at the time of this recording, warning that the virus is still circulating and needs to be carefully heeded. The world celebrated the International Day Against Drug Abuse on the 26th of June. Since 1987, the United Nations has adopted the International Day Against Drug Abuse and Illicit Trafficking following a recommendation of the International Conference on Drug Abuse and Illicit Trafficking. The aim of this global celebration is to combat drug abuse 
and to raise awareness among societies about the dangers of drugs. Hadil Fahed met with Dr. Adil Zayed, director of Kuwait Addiction Treatment Center, to talk about the repercussions of addiction. Since 1987, the United Nations has adopted uh, the International Day for Against Drug Abuse. This year in 2020, the theme is uh, the better knowledge for the better care. The reason knowledge is important, one, uh, the family expect that once a patient reaches uh, an addiction treatment center or rehabilitation center, he should come out of this uh, a center in what, uh, whatever time, uh, 21 days, a month, or more or less, he should come out of this as an angel. Emphasizes the need to improve the understanding of the world drug problem and how, in turn, better knowledge will foster greater international cooperation for containing its impact on health, governance, and security. This annual uh, celebration, this annual international day, it is so much important uh, to uh, just uh, give uh, the, a clear message that uh, recovery, uh, it's not easy, it is difficult, but it is possible. Uh, the way we usually actually celebrate this day here in Kuwait is not just to uh, emphasize out the theme of the day, but actually to show some examples of ex-addicts who were able to recover Despite increased efforts by states, relevant organizations, civil society and non-governmental organizations, the drug abuse problem continues to pose a serious threat to public health, human safety and well-being. An international conference has vowed to provide around 1.8 billion US dollars to Sudan in order to help the Northeast African country battle its economic crisis. Countries and international organizations participating in the Sudan Partnership Conference will provide funds to finance the country's transitional period. The European Union said it would offer $350 million, while Germany pledged to give $168 million. The pledges were well below the $8 billion in aid that Sudan's Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok said last August was needed to turn around an economy in crisis since the country lost almost all its oil revenue when South Sudan seceded in 2011. Demonstrations continue in the Gaza Strip as Palestinians strongly reject Israeli annexation plans. The latest marches come just four days before the scheduled date for the annexation amid widespread Arab and international rejection. Yumn al Sayyid has the details in Gaza. In the midst of an ongoing tension in the political scene due to the Israeli plan and decision of annexation of the West Bank and Jordan Valley on the 1st of July 2020, Palestinian popular protests continue taking part on a weekly basis condemning and announcing the refusal to this decision made according to the implementation of the American deal of the century declared by Trump of the American administration. We come here today to stand against any annexation and confiscation of the West Bank lands and to send a clear message that Gaza and the West Bank are united to free Palestine. All annexation policies and decisions declared by the Israeli occupation are rejected. Despite all Palestine peace efforts met, it seems that all peaceful solutions have failed for the past 20 years. Earlier last night, Speaker of Al Qassam Brigades, the militant wing of Hamas, threatened that any annexation implemented by Israel in the coming days will be considered by the resistance a clear declaration of war and will hold consequences. While Israel replied with consistence to its decision, despite all Arab and international refusal positions. If the Israeli enemy is threatening Gaza and the people of Gaza, he knows for sure that Gaza in many times has stood in front of this enemy and is able to make him pay the price of any crimes against our people and nation. 
From its side, last night Israel began increasing its forces on the borders with Gaza Strip as it deployed dozens of tanks on the borders of the enclave. While Gantz, the Israeli defense minister, threatened Hamas according to his statement, the first to pay the price of any aggression against Israel. A global fundraising meeting last week raised 6.9 billion US dollars from the United States, the European Commission, and numerous countries to fight COVID-19, with many participants stressing that an eventual vaccine should be available to anyone who needs it. For her part, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said the money will be used for COVID-19 tests, treatments, and vaccines, and also to support the world's poorest and most marginalized communities. Forty governments took part in the pledging summit, which is part of a joint initiative by the EU executive and advocacy group Global Citizen. The Kuwait Red Crescent Society hosted a food distribution camp in El Jahra as part of their ongoing campaigns to provide people that were affected by the lockdown with their basic needs. The Ministry of Interior also participated in this campaign to ensure the safety of the people on site by ensuring social distancing and to ensure that people are following the health guidelines. More on the following with Saleh al Hubaidi. The Kuwait Red Crescent Society continues to distribute food baskets to those affected from the lockdown during the COVID-19 pandemic. In this campaign, they distributed approximately 1,500 food baskets to people in need in Al-Jahra. So we will starting uh, today in Jahra. We're covering the laborers who, who's living in this way, and this is the place. Uh, we have uh, around 1,500 uh, parcel for food, and we have uh, 1,500 carton of milk. We distributed to the, all the laborers here, and uh, uh, we hope so to covering little of this is the laborers who's living here. You know, this is Al Jahra is big. Uh, big place uh, in Kuwait. We we trying to covering here before we covering Mah Mahbula and uh, Jilib Shukh and also Khaitan and Farwaniya, and we we starting now uh, uh, with our volunteer to covering this is people here. The food baskets included essentials that include rice, oil, chicken, canned goods, and milk. The food baskets are supposed to last the recipients for a period of at least two weeks. Today we're here to give out uh, different food products and such as milk, rice, sugar, to help those in need who are currently here in Jahra and needing the aid from the Hilal Ahmad. We're doing so out of the kindness of our hearts because we love this country and are trying to help it as much as we can. All in all, the Red Crescent Society continues to be active and to provide support for whoever that is in need. These humanitarian campaigns are part of the society's key activities in addition to providing aid to the Ministry of Health and Quality Insights and the Kuwait International Airport. Madrid City Hall lit up the skies with drones as a tribute to COVID-19 victims and for those who have fought the virus in Spain. 40 programmed drones with multicolored LED lights shone over Madrid, creating different forms including a heart and two people, messages of hope and thank you as well as flags of other countries fighting the coronavirus pandemic. Madrid's local government said the location of the performance remained a secret until it took place to avoid crowds and a large gathering. For the first time in U.S. history, a chamber of the United States Congress voted 232 to 180 in favor of giving Washington, D.C. statehood, a move towards fuller voting rights for the African-American city majority. The vote was along party lines, with Democrats who controlled the House supporting it, and while historic, it was symbolic as Republicans in the Senate and President Donald Trump opposed the move. Meanwhile, Eleanor Holmes Norton, who is Washington's non-voting delegate, said that Americans are taking down the remnants of the alliance as symbols of inequality, just as the House of Representatives is rising up in the nation's capital to ensure equality for its citizens.
athletes gathered to conduct a medical survey to detect COVID-19 in the Sports Medicine Center for Health and Awareness in Khaldia. Swab surveys were carried out for players, administrators, and coaches from various games before being allowed to resume work and training by the Tripartite Committee formed by the General Authority for Sports, the Olympic Committee, and the Health Ministry. Isra al Shamiri has more in the following. As a prelude to the return of sports activity in Kuwait by launching team training, the Sports Medicine Center for Health and Awarenesses in Khaldia began applying COVID-19 test examination to all athletes of various games in implementation of health authorities' instructions and in accordance with the approved international protocols. As we all know, there is a pandemic uh, around the world, which is the COVID-19 that spread around the continent and uh, even in Kuwait. And for the joint committee, that is a committee assembled by Kuwait Olympic Committee, also the Public Authority for Sport and the Ministry of Health. Those joint committee will do or will make a regulation for the, uh, for the uh, sport to come back, as they say, and for the athletes. And there are some regulations and rules to, uh, for the athletes to, to practice their, uh, their sport in general. The green light will not be given to start training in any club or federation unless the facilities are completely satellized and swabs are taken for players, administrators, coaches and employees of this club and all results must be negative. And today I'm here in Khaldia Hospital thanks to the public authority of sport to take the tampon against the COVID-19. All clubs, in cooperation with the Tripartite Committee, sent the statement of those they wish to examine and stress the application of health requirements and obligation set by the International Federation and the Ministry of Health to ensure the safety of all before, during and after the training. Also, the test will take less than five minutes for the swab to be taken by the physicians and uh, medical staff for the athletes. And after that, the result will be uh, uh, text to the, uh, to, the, to the athlete by an SMS within or less than 24 hours. We would like here to thank all the athletes and federation and clubs in Kuwait for their full cooperation with us and uh, we demand more cooperation with the, from them to finish this and uh, to, uh, to finish this test and also to uh, make it happen for the sport to come back. The center is seeking, in cooperation with the Tripartite Committee, to complete the conduct of 6,000 swabs for athletes and that the capacity of center will increase to take 400 swabs daily. However, the taking swabs will continue even after the start of the club training and according to the reports of Tripartite Committee. Hong Kong police arrested at least 53 people after scuffles erupted during a relatively peaceful protest against planned national security legislation to be implemented by the mainland Chinese government. The proposed national security law has raised concerns among Hong Kong democracy activists and some foreign governments that Beijing is further eroding the extensive autonomy promised when Britain handed the territory back to China in 1997. China's National People's Congress Standing Committee reviewed a draft of the bill, affirming that the law will target only a small group of troublemakers as it tackles separatism, subversion, terrorism, and foreign interference in Hong Kong. The Kuwait Institute of Scientific Research, or KISR, harnesses the potentials of its various sectors to work alongside all ministries particularly the Ministry of Health, to confront the COVID-19 virus. Kisser stresses that it will not spare efforts in the service of the community in coordination with the various ministries to protect the society from such crises. Hedil Fahed has more. Kisser Environment and Life Science Center developed an advanced technology program 
where a team of researchers specialized in molecular biology and genetics work to support the MOH efforts toward the containment of the pandemic. KISER has uh, submitted more than 14 uh, proposals and projects uh, for the detection and the monitoring the uh, viral loads or viral presence in different sites of environments, either in the air or in the water or another, any other environments. Some cells in the respiratory system is more susceptible to be infected by coronavirus due to the activity of two certain proteins that facilitate the spread of the virus in the body. Once it recognizes the receptors on the cell that infects, uh, it infects, uh, it directly uh, goes inside and replicate in many copies uh, so uh, it can, uh, what do you call it, do its uh, repeated job at every cell. And once the cell gets filled up with a large number of viral uh, uh, quantity, it moves on to the second cell uh, by attaching to the, the same receptor on the second cell and do the job again and again until it destroys a number of cells in that organ and make the, a failure of that organ like what we are seeing in the respiratory uh, system that people have shortness of breath or difficulty in breathing that's because uh, more cells are destroyed in their lungs. Kuwait Institute of Scientific Research harnesses uh, the potentials of its various sectors to work alongside all the ministry, particularly the Ministry of Health, to confront coronavirus. The coronavirus pandemic, which has virtually grounded global air traffic since March, has pushed several struggling airlines over the edge, while many global giants have seen record losses and a dependency on government bailouts to keep afloat. The COVID-19 pandemic has crippled air travel, leading to an unprecedented number of flight cancellations globally, as nations across the world began enforcing strict lockdown measures. By April, International seat capacity had dropped by almost 80% from a year ago, and half the world's airplanes were in storage, data showed, suggesting the aviation industry may take years to recover from the pandemic. Flights have been limited, and strict hygiene measures have been implemented to try and regain confidence in the industry at a time when many countries are lifting tight restrictions on mobility. With demand for cargo flights increasing, to help transport medical equipment and supplies, engineers would take around 36 hours to remove seats from a plane to convert it into a cargo plane. Officials in Libya reported that nine additional unidentified bodies were recovered inside mass graves in the city of Tarhuna. The source explained that the new finding brought the total number of recovered bodies to 19 since the Libyan General Authority for Research and Identification of Missing Persons began working in the city. Meanwhile, an international criminal court prosecutor expressed concern over recent reports about multiple mass graves found in Tarhuna and its surroundings. Poland's President Andrzej Duda came top in the first round of the country's presidential election, but fell short of the overall majority needed to avoid what looks set to be a tight runoff vote on July the 12th. Duda received 45.24% of the vote, according to results based on 87.2% of the total number of polling districts. If the results are confirmed, Duda, a conservative, will face the Liberal mayor of Warsaw, Rafał Trzaskowski, in the second round in two weeks' time. The Wimbledon Tennis Championship, meant to begin on the 29th of June, has been delayed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The virus forced the only grass court Grand Slam to be delayed for the first time since World War II. The All England Lawn Tennis Club announced on April 1st that it was impossible for the tournament to go on as originally scheduled for June the 29th 
till July 12th. Unlike the French Open, which is played on clay, Wimbledon's scope for rearranging the start date was extremely limited. Police in Pakistan said that four gunmen attacked the Pakistan Stock Exchange building by hurling hand grenades at security personnel in the southern port city of Karachi. Sources said that all the attackers had been killed by police and security forces after the gunmen stormed the building, leaving several people killed and injured. There was no immediate claim of responsibility for the attack in the country that has long been plagued by militant violence, but attacks have become less frequent in recent years. Barcelona have reached an agreement to sell Brazilian midfielder Arthur Melo to Juventus for a fee of 72 million euros and signed Bosnian Miralem Janic from the Italian champions for 60 million. The 23-year-old, generally known as Arthur, will remain at Camp Nou until the end of the 2019-2020 season, which has been extended until August due to the COVID-19 pandemic before moving to Turin. Pjanic will also move to Camp Nou at the end of the campaign and sign a four-year contract containing a release clause of 400 million euros. President Vladimir Putin urged Russians to vote for constitutional changes that would allow him to run again for president twice, calling the reforms a guarantor of stability, security, and prosperity. Russia's two houses of parliament have already approved the amendments, but Putin reiterated they would only take effect if supported by a majority of voters. Russians began voting last week on the package of constitutional changes proposed by Putin, including a reset of presidential term limits that would allow him to run twice again after his current six-year term ends in 2024. Putin made no mention during his speech of how the constitutional changes could affect his own political career, a constant feature of the official campaign to encourage people to vote which has stressed other amendments rather than the one that would allow him to stay in power until 2036 if re-elected. Chinese lawmakers voted to adopt the law of the People's Republic of China on safeguarding national security in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. President Xi Jinping signed a presidential order to promulgate the law, which went into effect on the 30th of June. The newly adopted decision stipulates that the law shall be applied in Hong Kong by way of promulgation by the region. The law prohibits secession, subversion, terrorism, and collusion with a foreign country or external elements to endanger national security with a maximum penalty of life in prison. The World Health Organization's Regional Director for the Americas, Sarissa Etienne, warned in a virtual briefing from Washington that countries, states, and cities that relax restrictions too soon can be flooded with new COVID-19 cases. Etienne said that Washington State and New York are seeing very low numbers of new cases and deaths, but 27 other states in the U.S. are reporting exponential growth. The Americas region reported 5.1 million cases and more than 247,000 deaths due to COVID-19 as of June the 29th. The WHO official said the Americas is the world epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic and the death toll for the whole region could almost triple to 637,000 by October the 1st, though she cautioned that mathematical model projections should not be taken literally but only as planning guides. The European Union reopened its borders to a select list of safe countries as the World Health Organization warned the pandemic is still accelerating with more than almost half a million deaths worldwide. Europe's gradual reopening comes as countries around the globe 
struggle to revive economic activity while battling new spikes of COVID-19, with hotspots still surging in Latin America and the United States. After days of negotiations, EU members are due to finalize the list of some 15 countries, including Australia, Canada, Thailand, Japan, and others, whose citizens will be free to enter the bloc. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence said he was optimistic about the progress being made on treatments for coronavirus patients and the development of a vaccine. Pence also noted that the government was distributing another tranche of remdesivir this week. Remdesivir is expected to be in high demand as one of the only treatments so far shown to alter the course of the virus. After intravenously administered medicine helped shorten hospital recovery times in a clinical trial, it won emergency use authorization in the United States and full approval in Japan. The drug is believed to be most effective in treating patients earlier in the course of the disease. Still, remdesivir in its current formulation is only being used on patients sick enough to require hospitalization as a five-day treatment course. That's it for tonight. Join us again next week for more weekly news highlights.